Okay, good afternoon. It's time to start. Uh, thank you for being here with us tonight. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to be here for this webinar and to have the opportunity to co-chair uh, this, uh, this uh, meeting on transplant oncology uh, with Vincenzo Mazzaferro. Uh, and, and I will have the, the opportunity to introduce him uh, deeply. Vincenzo doesn't have uh, any need uh, any kind of introduction is one of the stars of uh, transplant uh, oncology and is will uh, is the one that has uh, uh, really informed and created a piece of science that everybody is still following uh, in many in many realities uh, worldwide um, so it's really a pleasure to have the opportunity to co-chair with him this uh, uh, this this webinar uh, the webinar on living transplantation oncology is in the context of a number of webinars that are uh, been set by ESOT uh, uh, in the context of the Milan 2021 Congress. Uh, and this is an absolute novelty in the, in the context of, of uh, ESOT Congress, uh, because uh, the idea behind this is to give a greater opportunity to have interaction with the community, with professionals, uh, in the particular setting of topics that are particularly relevant and uh, even though there will be, uh, you know, focus during the Congress uh, that uh, we think that uh, need to be, you know, expanded in terms of discussion, in, the, in terms of proposal, in, ter in terms of presentations. And, and clearly, uh, liver transplant oncology is one of these relevant topics. That's the reason why this is the number six webinar in a setting of 13 uh, meetings that we will uh, provide to you uh, in the next days. Uh, now let me know that let me let me tell you that uh, this will be recorded and will be available uh, on Transplant Live even uh, after the conference uh, on demand. So this will remain as a piece of uh, educational um, uh, information. Uh, um, I don't need to to recall which is the relevance of the of of transplantation oncology. Everybody is taking care of the transplantation every day in real life uh, uh, faces. Uh, decision-making process is very difficult in order to include, to exclude patients, to uh, allocate, to give priorities and to uh, uh, treat before and afterward after uh, the transplant. So we have a huge amount of topics to discuss tonight and that's the reason why I would like to uh, give uh, the podium to Vincenzo for his introduction and, and, uh, and uh, to go ahead with the, with the, with the program. <coughs> Vincenzo. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Umberto, for your kind introduction. Very generous. Uh, I'm, in fact, quite honored to share this uh, uh, moderation with you. Uh, it is a nice opportunity for, I would say, Italian school in transplantation to, to lead this uh, uh, area, which is a very important area in which uh, a lot of investment has been made in the last decade. Uh, I can predict, but it's not so difficult to predict that uh, transplant oncology will be uh, uh, the leading indication for liver transplantation in the years to come. And today we have a, this uh, a panel of experts uh, discussing various aspects of this uh, area. And the first one is in fact Umberto Cillo. Uh, he will present uh, a very interesting uh, uh, topic on uh, should we use the usual endpoint when measuring outcome in transplant oncology, uh, a clinical and ethical approach. This is a tr truly uh, informative lecture, uh, very important. And thank you, Umberto, it's your turn. Thanks, Vincenzo. In the meantime, that I'm uh, uh, sharing my uh, screen and going up, um, I would like to remind to all the, 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 the people that is attending to the meeting that uh, there is a possibility in any time to propose questions and to have answers. And that the question in, in your you know, question and answer um, uh, section, and, and please type it in and, and we will be happy to respond as soon as possible, uh, anytime during the, the, the presentation. So uh, very, very briefly, I thought it would be very brief, but this is a, a difficult topic, um, but uh, as Vincenzo was saying, a relevant one. Uh, and in, in a sense, uh, starts from a theoretical area, but at the end of the day, it goes into 
uh, a very clinical, very practical kind of approach because it's important in order to understand which is the role of transplantation in the day-by-day real-life uh, clinical activity. I don't have anything to, to declare and, uh, uh, and I even don't need to emphasize how in the future we're going to see more and more patients in our waiting list due to, ca to cancer. We are now uh, looking at uh, the future as a, an epidemiological transition. We're going to see more and more elder pa patients and elder patients are more prone to uh, be indicated for transplantation due to cancer. And so there is an implicit uh, and, and very predictable future of an increasing number of cancer that will be transplanted in the liver setting. But so, which are the relevant endpoints that we need to take into consideration in oncology and in liver transplantation oncology? So, which are the endpoints and the measure that we have to take in mind in our decision making processes? Well, it's very, very, very easy to, to answer to this question is clearly overall survival and in liver transplantation setting is intention to treat survival from the moment of waiting list uh, of the patients. And, and overall survival is the gold standard, is that the core business is, uh, I would say, the backbone of what we need to look at when we uh, talk about transplantation. Why? Because nothing is more important than the span of life and the death of the patient. This is a real uh, end point. But uh, there are some negative drawbacks, for example, and the most relevant one, one is that the study needed to have good ideas about raw survival are long studies. It is time consuming, it's, it's, it's needing a lot of costs, and maybe randomized clinical trials, which are particularly difficult in the setting of transplantation. So, uh, researcher and people has tried to put in the place uh, and on the table a number of surrogate measures and disease-free survival is one of that but also time to progression, progression-free survival, uh, rate of recurrence, any any other you know relatively earlier endpoint which is able to give information a little bit earlier, a little bit faster than overall survival. So the question here are these uh, surrogate, overall, uh, surrogate of overall survival good enough to be used in clinical practice? Well, the answer is immediately probably not. Um, because as far as the methodologists say, uh, when they look uh, in the validation study, the correlation between, for example, progression free survival, but also disease free survival and overall survival, they are able to find that in more than half of the cases of the validation studies, they were not able to find really a tight correlation between the two. Uh, in other words, overall survival is one thing and progression is, is another one and there is no correlation between the two. So there is a lot of controversy how to correct, to fix these discrepancies in order to have early measures but which uh, have uh, meaning in the real life clinical practice and also in the scientific studies. This is a fantastic study by Jordi Bruich this year published in Pathology. Look at it please, it's, it's informative. It gives you the idea why there is this discrepancy. Because when you have a long uh, um, uh, course between diagnosis, radiological progression or recurrence after, after surgery and death, a huge amount of variable can change, you know, the time and the prospective survival of this patient. And, 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 and this is a, a confounding bias. And this is the reason why uh, progression-free survival, disease-free survival may be impacted, for example, by treatment. So you may have the same kind of time to recurrence, for example, but if you apply, uh, you know, different treatment, then the death is prolonged in a way, and the survival is prolonged. So there is a discrepancy between um, the disease-free survival, the progression-free survival, and overall survival. And this is just to be concrete, very practical, this is the case of colorectal metastasis. Uh, everybody knows this study, and also surgery. Dueland, the group of, from Oslo, they depicted a fantastic 83% survival, overall survival, five years post transplantation for colorectal non resectable metastasis. But on the contrary, less, less than 40% disease free survival. There is an incredible discrepancy between these two measures. And there is also clear reason for that because the progression pattern are extremely variable after transplantation because the site of spread is different. For example, the lung metastases are not impacting survival, whereas liver metastases are very much impacting survival. The growth rate is not so fast 
as expected, and our studies show that the, the growth rate is pretty similar. Uh, not all, in all cases, the liver condition underlying is, is conditioned, you know, by uh, the recurrence, and you have the possibility of the number of treatments, surgical, uh, radiological, and even uh, from the chemotherapeutic point of view. So that's the reason why disease free survival is not correlated with overall survival. So when will you look at the usage, the role of liver transplantation for colorectal liver uh, transplantation uh, for colorectal metastasis, you are supposed to look at this measure much more than this one, at least as a primary endpoint. This opens to visionary ideas, because if you consider that we are going to make cancer sort of manageable chronic disease, uh, probably liver transplantation in a very cautious way in a very selected way, in a very controlled patterns, may be one of the elements and the tools that we may use in order to maintain a chronic disease under control, but with a prolonged of Rosubara if compared to um, alternative therapies. And this is a fantastic visionary study. It shows how you may have changes in the tumor burden according to treatment pressure, monitoring, uh, you know, surveillance and stuff like that. And you also have changes in liquid biopsy profile, maybe in most cases with the reduction of heterogeneity, which gives you a number of pieces of information and potential for treatment molecularly targeted uh, in the course of the disease. So there is room to have these diseases with less biological aggressiveness in a way under control in time. So again, we can influence and use liver transplantation, maybe in the future as one of these tools. But biology is important. If you look at, 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 as a measure like, uh, you know, for example, uh, disease free survival or time to progression, you may have this situation where you have a chemotherapy with a long, prolonged, uh, stable disease, for example, or an intervention, for example, a liver transplant with a bad biological selection, and you have a very bad immediate recurrence post transplantation, and you do a very bad job in that because you badly selected the patient, you have a death that is occurring much earlier than it is a mediocre, a stable disease with a, a systemic chemical. So watch out to biology. So even though overall survival is fundamental as considering the rural transplantation, disease-free survival, recurrence rate, progression-free survival, time to progression, stuff like that, and measure like that, may be very important in our study to define which are the prognostic element that may impact uh, the recurrence that in turn, in long term, may impact survival. Maybe in middle long term may have an impact on survival. So we have to use this measure in prognosis studies in order to improve our capability to select in and out patients. Now we have uh, uh, a number of tools, methodological tools, I will go very quickly, but this, uh, this one is the concept of cancer-related death, uh, and survivor, which is very useful in order to detect in a very homogeneous population, let's say a cell carcinoma T2 uh, uh, in, in well compensated cellulosis, which are the cancer related uh, reasons, which are the cancer related factors, and try to identify this factor and to put this factor in, into a selection process. So this is a good methodology, but which is dedicated to understand the disease for survival, the proportion of recurrence much more than overall survival. And the other methodology that is, is, is going to be expanded is the time varying dependent uh, multivariate survival analysis, which in turn have the capability to weight the different elements that may you know, interfere or intervene in the course of the disease. And they were able to give a different weight in terms of uh, prognostic weighting on, on death, on overall survival of the different elements. And this, this will be the future of our study. And then we are going to have in this direction a huge amount of pathophysiology study on immunogenomics, epigenomics, you know, single cell characterization, uh, liquid uh, biopsy, interface between immune system and cancer. We are going to have a number of pieces of information in terms of our capability to biologically stratify patients and to reduce and to implement disease free survival to reduce recurrence rate and in turn also overall survival, but not necessarily so tightly as I showed you before. So, going back quickly to overall survival, 
is overall survival or intention to treat overall survival self-sufficient in our clinical practice? No, the, the answer is no, because we need to compare liver transplantation with alternatives because we use scarce resource and we have to know which is the alternative for patients that do not have uh, liver transplantation. And we have methodology for that, gaining life expectancy, uh, better quality adjusted, many and median survival this difference this year, or the absolute risk reduction, number needed to treat. You know, basically all the, the measure that gives you an idea, which is the area under the cure between, between the two expected survival with transplantation and without transplantation. And, and Vincenzo did a fantastic job uh, doing a randomized clinical trial. This is the XXL showing the gain in life expectancies between patients having downstaging and transplantation versus the alternative simple downstaging. With this piece of information, you can really tightly and precisely say, okay, liver transplant gains how many months over an alternative treatment in the setting of downstaging and advanced, relatively advanced carcinoma. So these are the studies that we need to have in order to calculate our ASO ratio or number needed to treat. Someone can say, okay, but in real life, we do not have uh, pieces of information. Well, this is partially true. This is UK, is the setting of allocation fantastically done by the UK people. You can see how they can predict it, we can be more or less precise, but they are trying to predict the, the need. Uh, in other words, the expected survival without transplantation, the expected survival with transplantation, they calculate the benefit and they can compare the benefit uh, expected between different etiologists they have in the same waiting list at the same moment. And this is a fantastic tool in order to equalize and to give an equitable kind of opportunity for the patient in the same way it is. So need for benefit studies as much as we can. Let me go very fast. Uh, you will find on demand this slide and I will skip this. Just focusing on what we have now on trial goal available, which are the study that in the future will give us answers on benefit. In, for example, correct metastasis because it's very interesting setting. This is a transmet, the study that everybody knows, France, René Adam, Nine, 90 patient randomized clinical trials, endpoint primary overall survival three years. Very nice study. It will give precise, I think, pieces of information about the benefit between the two, chemotherapy versus liver transplantation. Then the Sulmate, Sweden, 45, a little bit less patient, only extended cannaveric disease, uh, extended criteria uh, donors, so escaping you know, the wait list in a way, randomized again, clinical trial, again, overall five years survival, then less good uh, studies. The second two, powerful effort by Norway, stratified patient according to four, four arms, uh, randomization between liver transplantation and liver resection, or prospective analysis of metachronous uh, metastasis, synchronous metastasis, synchronous transplanted with extended criteria donor. Massive piece of information by this. But look at this, 2027 is going to require time. You know, overall survival is time consuming. SECA3 is very similar with the comparison between liver transplantation and intervention, again, randomized. Then we have a couple of Italian studies, the COL study, and Vincenzo will say something probably about that. Very selective, uh, KRAS, wild type, uh, um, very nice oncologic selection. Uh, again, control because it's controlled with the court of uh, triplet study. Uh, so we are going to have pieces of information about benefit in this setting. As well, we are going to do in part of a melodic study, again on disease donor, again, relati relatively less um, selective because we are including KRAS uh, mutated patients. Again, we have a court of control in the patient that are treated with only chemotherapy at the same time in the same manner prospectively in order to calculate our transplant benefit. Again, focusing on overall survival. Five year. Let me tell you that the second study is pointing to 10 year survival, which is open the discussion about, which is the time horizon. Probably 10 years is the fantastic time horizon in order to take into consideration. And then last but not least, Canada is putting in place living donation in order to escape the, the issue of competition, the waiting list again, overall survival as primary endpoint and exploratory area 
uh, with rapid technique. I don't need to explain to you which rapid is. A couple of studies focusing on the feasibility. Our study from Padua, we are starting enrollment. We already did a couple of cases. Rapid uh, in the original Oslo experience, again, prospective, again, focusing on feasibility and safety and the lift to heal, uh, which is done in, 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 uh, in Jena, in Germany, uh, again, living donation, uh, but it's focusing on overall survival. Again, these are powerful to me, uh, very interesting. Couple of, uh, a few more concepts, how to translate benefit data that we are going to have in real life uh, transplantation. Well, in any particular waiting list, in any particular situation, you have to wait at least roughly, more and more precisely in the future, the difference between the individual uh, transplant benefit and the harm of the waiting list. Because every time that you give a benefit of gaining life expectancy to a single patient, you have an arm on the waiting list because you remove uh, that particular organ from the availability of the overall population. So you, in the future, we need to be able to calculate the net benefit, which is individual transplant benefit minus the harm on the waiting list. We try to do that with the Markov model, uh, taking advantage of the pandemic and try to see which is the changes according to the organ decrease that we have been experiencing during the COVID. But you may, you know, infer that also consider that in terms of increasing wait list. Because if you open your indication and you enlarge your criteria, you are supposed to have more patients in your waiting list. So your net benefit is going to change. If you have more waiting list patients, then you need to have a greater expected transplant benefit in order to have a positive net benefit. So your selectin is supposed to be uh, even more accurate in the direction to select a patient more in need for transplantation with more potential for gaining life expectancies as in this situation here when you have 30% plus patient waiting in the waiting list you cannot select a patient with a, a small transplant benefit you need to have very high transplant benefit in this setting so we have concrete ideas on how to translate in clinical practice but let me go to uh, ethical issues which are uh, as important as, 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 as the measures. Um, when you have a cadaveric situation, you have a competition. Um, and, and in no situation, you have a, a, a harm on the waiting list. An escape strategy is to use living donation, which is a, a fantastic potential. If you use right living donor liver transplantation, you do not have basically harm on the waiting list. But on the contrary, you may have a harm on the, on the potential donor because you may have up to 1% mortality. Let, let's be concrete on that. So you need to be aware that when you have your indication considered, then you have a transplant, need to have a transplant benefit, which is good enough, wide enough to compensate the risk for the donor. This has been, you know, already faced in the literature this point, right, even. 10 years ago, Shane, showing how that if you have a risk of 1% mortality, you need to have a select patient with high transplant benefit. Big differences between a better survival without transplantation and with transplantation and with good results post-transplant, let's say at least 50% survival five years post-transplantation. But there is another fantastic strategy for the future, which is full left in the living setting, living donation for left transplantation or rapid technique, left latter. Why this is so fascinating? Because you do not have harm on the waiting list and your risk on the donor is relatively smaller. You probably do not have mortality here. The mortality is down to less than 0.01%, similar to kidney donation. And this is the perfect setting where you optimize your net benefit, which is good in waiting list, in cadaveric situation, a better in living donation, but even greater in the setting of rapid technique, less uh, living donation. And in this situation, we are more prone to enlarge our indication because you have more room to achieve a net benefit at the end of the day. I hope that this is easy and clear to everybody. This must last, last, last slide, just to summarize, Sorry to be theoretical, too theoretical, but this is have big implication in practice. 
you need to have clear in mind which is your intention to treat overall survival if compared to therapeutic alternatives. And you should do this exercise for each patient in each particular waiting list situation in order to optimize your way to use donor resources, you know. And in the future, you're going to correct this with quality. So we are going to have survival benefit quality adjusted. And this is going to be the, the major endpoint that you have to take into consideration. In the same time, we need to develop study, focus on recurrence rate, disease free survival, viral progression, uh, free survival, and so on, through competing risk analysis, through time dependent multivariate analysis, so cancer related survival analysis, and pathophysiological studies, because we need that. Why? to refine our process of inclusion exclusion, which in turn with, at the end of the day, uh, improve our end survival, but is not our first end point, at least to my view. In a, in a, in a population of cadaveric donation, you need to balance and to try to have always a situation with the benefit of the patient is greater than the harm on the waiting list. And we can do example on that. And finally, living donation is the future to escape this situation of competition for donor scarcity, in particular, developing techniques that are pushing on left liver donation in order to have clear net benefit. Overall, why we decide with Vincenzo to start with the theoretical piece of information? Because we need a full awareness on endpoint by every clinician in the field, because awareness makes your decision-making process um, more efficient on one side, and then is promote cooperation between uh, the different centers because we need big numbers, because we need computational medicine in order to have better, uh, a better precision in terms of you know, quantification of all these measures that we've taken uh, so far. I'm stopping here, probably I, I've been taking too much time. Vincenzo, to you. Present Vincenzo again. Vincenzo doesn't have any, any need for, for any presentation. Uh, uh, again, he, he is one of the most relevant scientists, and we are waiting for his pieces of information on our response to therapy and the moving target of patient selection. Vincenzo, I don't know if you're ready. Okay, I'm trying to. Okay, I think I'm fine now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, again, thank you very much for this opportunity to present some of, uh, you know, thoughts, I would say, on uh, what is a already a well-known condition in cancer care, which is the uh, response to therapy. Response to therapy is already something that is very much used in uh, cancer uh, uh, decision-making but it's a relatively new concept in transplant oncology. Uh, here you have a sort of visual abstract of what I'm going to say in the next 10, 20 minutes or so. Uh, nowadays, the multidisciplinary strategies against the pathocellular carcinoma are based on observation, observation on uh, how the tumor presents, how the tumor behaves, uh, how treatment are applicable and effectiveness in the, in, the, in the management of this patient. But when liver transplantation is taken into account, some specific metrics takes over. And similarly to a lens uh, revealing the light spectrum, the multiphase prism of liver transplant is able to open kind of new perspectives and gives new interpretation to the result of several therapies, especially of the non-transplant therapies. And what are these liver transplant metrics? Uh, here you have a list, one no possible list. Uh, so according to which perspective liver transplant is considered, you can look at the benefit, you can look at the outcomes, you can look at the allocation, you can look at the expertise of the team, at the individual component of the patient, according to which perspective you want to look uh, and consider the treatment, the final judgment on any therapeutic strategy 
may vary. So there is again a spectrum of judgment in the uh, efficacy of various therapeutic options generated when the details are observed through the lens of liver transplantation. Uh, at the baseline, we have uh, also a couple of observations upon which almost everyone agrees. First observation is that in uh, ACC transplant contest, once the tumor recurs, the prognosis is very dismal. So although some progress has been made in recent years, the strongest predictors of post-transplant mortality in patients with ACC is recurrence of ACC. The second point is that without transplant, uh, ACC remains a kind of cancer that is very difficult to be considered cured, as Professor Cillo said, trying to uh, uh, convert a disease in a chronic disease is not exactly the curability of a disease. So even after complete removal of a single tumor, for example, of uh, less than five centimeters, uh, it takes about nine years uh, without recurrence for a patient to come back, to go back, to regain the expected survival of that particular age uh, population. There are several uh, papers demonstrating this. I just find a, uh, a meta-analysis, a last meta-analysis, recent meta-analysis investigating in a huge group of uh, more than 41,000 transplants for ACC that demonstrate a few things, but in a very, with very strong numbers. First, there is a promising decrease in ACC recurrence uh, over the last 30, 35 years. Second, the Milan criteria after so many years uh, still represent a big uh, prognostic factor, makes a strong difference in predicting recurrence. Uh, and third, the recurrence are observed more frequently in Asian series with respect to Western country, probably because of a less stringent selection criteria for living donation uh, exceeding Milan criteria uh, uh, in high percentage, and also as a consequence of the fact that the hepatitis B is the primary under, uh, underlying uh, uh, cause of ACC in Asia when compared to hepatitis C infection in Western uh, countries. So how we deal with ACC and liver transplantation nowadays? Here is, a, this is a crowded slide, I'm sorry, but this is just a summary of the current recommendation in the area summarized in the last International Liver Transplant Society consensus. Uh, I just uh, emphasize, I put in red the keywords, the keywords of this recommendation, obviously not reaching a final conclusion. And the words you can see here are selection, tumor biology, Milan criteria, composite criteria, response to therapy, so it is worth noting that it, there is a repeat recall of condition allowing consideration of transplantation with ACC, let's say with criteria not properly defined ideal candidate for liver transplant. So for them, the recommendation, most of the recommendation contains these words like bridging, downstaging, tumor response to treatment, et cetera. So the answer to this uh, request, I think is already in the literature in many studies that consider response to local regional treatment as a very practical tool uh, for selecting patients for liver transplantation and also to organize priority. Uh, uh, in fact, as you can see on the left side uh, uh, with the bridging and downstaging, you obtain a, a reduction in the risk of dropout on the waiting list according to the quality of response. Obviously, a patient with complete response has a low risk to drop out in comparison to patients with stable or progressive disease. And you have also a, a very much important, a very more important influence on the risk of post-transplant recurrence, uh, especially uh, which is much lower 
in those patients achieving complete response or normalization or uh, alpha fetoprotein uh, before transplantation. The spectrum, in other words, the spectrum of end treatment presentation is very granular in ACC. Uh, it goes from complete response within Milan criteria to sustain response beyond criteria to partial response. And this is worth a differential offer of liver transplant that can be organized in a kind of a stage progression scheme, which is uh, at the end a, a, a list of priority. The European guidelines recommend new adjuvant treatment as a tool to select, to better select patients for liver transplant and to shift the prognosis of liver transplantation in ACC. Here you have an example. You have a patient with three nodules presenting to you with three nodules, the largest of 4.5 and alpha fit of 150. This patient, according to the most of the criteria uh, uh, used uh, throughout the, all the centers, uh, is uh, uh, not eligible to liver transplant. But let's imagine this patient coming back to you, to your transplant board, after a few months of treatment, surgical, local, regional, and now with this new promising drug, also systemic treatment, coming back to you with the completely uh, uh, zeroed uh, uh, nodule and other uh, uh, condition with partial response. If you look at the now at this patient uh, carrying a two nodule ACC and a decrease in alpha fetoprotein, his uh, 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 post-treatment condition are eligible for liver transplant and eligible to a good prognosis also according to predictome calculator such as the metro ticket. And this is not a trivial issue because the search of the best allocation in donated organ uh, and the priority for liver, uh, for, uh, liver uh, transplantation in ACC patient is a persistent issue permanently unsolved ever since the MELD system, uh, which has nothing to do, by the way, with uh, oncology, has been introduced uh, as a driver for prioritizing patients on the basis of acuity uh, uh, of the candidate medical condition. Now, this I have summarized here the uh, indication and the system currently applied in the United States as a result of a huge effort in many extreme important health hospital and colleagues. I'm, I'm not in the position to criticize, propose any change. What I just like to notice is that there is a strong request of more flexible model in ACC, such as the metro ticket uh, here indicated in this review for expanding the transplant offer uh, with a reasonable success also in patient beyond conventional criteria. By the way, the metro ticket model creates a spectrum of liver transplant indication for ACC at incremental risk, uh, placing uh, uh, together with the, the mathematical interaction between the morphology of the tumor, the number of tumor nodules, and the size of the tumor with the, uh, the most used biological indicator of uh, uh, alpha fetoprotein. Using a calculator made free available, you can uh, calculate throughout the uh, uh, history of the patient, even during uh, 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 local regional treatment and waiting list treatment, uh, the predicted survival. Uh, and, and you can see here that has been uh, a, a very important uh, evolution in a, a increasing the predictability of the model when alpha fetoprotein was introduced on top of uh, uh, morphology, just morphology parameters. And even more precise outcome prediction can be obtained when response to local regional therapy is added to this model. Uh, in this study just published uh, this month in the Journal of Hepatology, some prudential restriction uh, are defined when uh, the uh, response uh, uh, according to m resist uh, uh, criteria are introduced in the metro ticket model. So the system evolves and gets more and more precise when incorporating more variables. The first uh, uh, prospective randomized trial on ACC downstaging is also 
uh, another uh, point I'd like to make. Uh, this is a trial which was designed uh, several years ago in uh, nine liver transplant center in Italy. The study focused on ACC beyond Milan, child A, having a prediction of survival of less than 50, uh, or at least, I'm sorry, 50% according to the metropical calculator. And after a successful downstaging, the patient were randomized to be listed and transplanted versus the best, I would say, non-transplant option. And uh, what is clear, uh, is, and I thank uh, uh, Umberto for having shown this before, uh, is that uh, uh, both on survival and tumor-free survival, the results are in favor of liver transplantation. So the main message of this uh, uh, trial is that rather than discussing on alternative criteria to select ACC patient, let's consider all comers and decide what to do on the basis of uh, response to our therapies. Uh, the last two points I'd like to make are also uh, emerging from this trial. The first one is that the tumor burden uh, calculated uh, as the sum of the, no uh, the, of the tumor nodule and the size of the largest nodule, the tumor burden uh, uh, follow over time showed you the real spectrum of efficacy of downstaging. So it goes from 7.3 at the baseline when the uh, downstaging protocol were initiated, going to zero at the time of randomization when the majority of patients had a, a, a very good response or and a complete response actually. But then there is a clear tendency, you can see here, to, for the tumor to regrow over time until the transplant is made. And at the time of transplant in the pathology placement, the tumor burden went back to 4.8. So there is a time related tendency of ACC to progress even after complete radiological response. And this different response is different in different patients. Again, the large spectrum of end treatment presentation uh, is granular. And it, the, most, the, the challenge is to understand who is uh, this patient with the uh, rapid progression after downstaging versus the others. The second point is uh, with respect to the transplant benefit, benefit already touched in the previous presentation. Uh, liver transplant produces significant gain in survival with respect to uh, non-transplant therapy, as I just said. But the point I'd like to make here that this benefit is much more pronounced in case of partial tumor response with respect to uh, a patient who had a, a complete response. Uh, it, it, the patient with partial response has a threefold increase in mean post-transplant survival time uh, with respect to patient with complete response. So it's about 27 months versus nine. Uh, this finding uh, supports the current tendency to assign priority to patient with ACC in the transplant wait list on the basis of tumor reassessment after neoadjuvant therapy, uh, considering that patient with partial response may should be prioritized with respect to patient with complete control of the tumor. And this also takes into account what I just showed of the time-related tendency of the tumor to regrow over time. So how to conclude? I think that multiple metrics of liver transplant are like a spectrometer. They, they, we, 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 we see at the picture of a treatment uh, under different lens according to what kind of a metric we adopt uh, of the many metrics in place for liver transplantation. The selection criteria, uh, there, is, uh, there remain a necessity uh, uh, and probably composite criteria adding more variables uh, get more and more precise and in practice individualize the prognosis in each of our patients. The selection 
of our patient based on response to treatment uh, uh, turns to be the best selection criteria until some biology uh, marker will appear, uh, the response to therapy remains the best selection tool. In the XXL trial, we demonstrate with the level one evidence uh, and the, the, the benefit of transplantation uh, in the intermediate advanced ACC stage. This is a very important message for our hepatologists, for our oncologists, uh, which uh, uh, according to algorithm uh, uh, endorsed by the major society, reserve liver transplantation only to patients in the early stages. Now we have the demonstration that also the intermediate and advanced stage, if properly treated, can be uh, cured uh, uh, with liver transplant. So the shift of the algorithm is, uh, in the BCLC algorithm is from uh, right to left. And according to the transplant benefit principle, the decision on weight list priority uh, has to include, should include the downstaging, uh, the time-related tendency uh, of the tumor to growth, and of course, uh, uh, the need to prioritize patient with partial response. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, Vincenzo. Really uh, very informative. Uh, and thanks also for having underlined how the response to therapy is crucial. Uh, you know how uh, in Italy we have been, you know, pushing on that uh, in, in the last 20 years and, and you have been able to put that in a fantastic pieces of science and uh, this is uh, makes uh, make us very happy. There are already a few questions, but uh, for the sake of time, I think that we need to go and then try to respond in a brief discussion section afterward, uh, Vincenzo, if you agree. Um, and with that in mind, I would like to invite uh, uh, into the podium uh, um, at the next spe speaker, uh, which is Elena Bozzi. Elena is uh, in a fantastic radiologist, which is working in the context of uh, the interventional radiology setting of the University of uh, Pisa, Italy. And, uh, and now is, is, faking, is, is absolutely consequent to the Mazzaferro and Vincenzo's uh, uh, presentation because uh, Vincenzo raised the, the issue how to define response uh, uh, from the macromorphological point of view. I think that this is one of the crucial points and a critical point in a way. Uh, but also I, I hope that uh, Elena will be able also to expand a little bit also to other, the other new indication for, for transplantation. I don't know if Elena is ready. For... Yes, I am. You, you can. Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction, and uh, it's quite hard for me to speak after you and Professor Mazzaferro, but I will try to. And um, so in the setting of transplant oncology, the selection of patients is, so is crucial, and images plays a pivotal role, but uh, there are some particular aspects to be considered um, when we are transplant patients with colorectal meds, uh, neuroendocrine meds, uh, and the epithelioid hemangiomatelioma or cholangiocarcinoma, and uh, as well as in the setting of uh, ACC, uh, considering uh, as told um, bridging and downstaging therapies. Uh, so, as far as colorectal meds uh, is concerned, we know that uh, we can transplant patients only uh, if uh, disease uh, is in the liver. And so, uh, as a radiological point of view, we can uh, evaluate these with contrast enhanced CT and liver specific uh, um, contrast MR. But uh, of paramount importance is uh, PET. In fact, um, um, the COV, MTB, and TB ratio can predict the recurrence after a uh, liver transplant. And uh, uh, also we can say that uh, um, the utility of uh, the PET not only identify occult disease undetected by contrast CD, but also the observed prognosis value of elevated metabolic tumor volume and the tumor glycolysis. So in future, pre-transplantation PET um, protocols should advantageously have special focus on lymph nodes in the upper abdomen. And the assessment of contrast CT should particularly be focused on small lung metastasis. Um, oh. I don't know why. Can you have- uh... Okay. 
And um, so I will show you a patient, female, with a multiple bilobar synchronous liver metastasis, uh, who underwent uh, left hemicolectomy um, because of uh, a, um, uh, um, a carcinoma, and uh, she underwent CERT in August 2018, but uh, uh, he progressed, uh, uh, we can see in this city acquired in March 2021. And so we discussed the patient for a, a transplant. In fact, uh, the PET shows us uh, the absence of extra hepatic involvement uh, and also the absence of uh, lymph node involvement with uh, a COV of uh, liver lesions of 22. And so she was um, transplanted in April 2021. Um, as far as the uh, neuroendocrine meds uh, are concerned, we know that uh, the gallium PET uh, uh, is the optimal method for diagnosis, um, but uh, we also know that MR, particularly the combined set of diffusion weighted and hepatobiliary phase images, yields to the highest sensitivity and specificity for net liver meds detection. And these authors uh, evaluate also the possibility to use the scintigraphy with hemic talk for the diagnosis of neuroendocrine tumor, particularly because uh, the gallium generator for labeling the data to date is very expensive. And so they show um, quite good sensitivity specificity um, for this. Uh, um, uh, this method. And so um, the scintigraphy we talk can represent a useful imaging radio tracer uh, in this kind of tumor with slightly higher sensitivity, higher imaging quality, and lower radiation exposure for patients compared to OctroScan. And this is a patient uh, with um, a, a neuroendocrine tumor from ileocecal valve um, submitted to uh, right hemicolectomy. Uh, and uh, uh, MR with a pathospecific contrast agent shows uh, an um, uh, liver disease growing uh, in uh, dimension and number of lesions uh, until uh, last uh, MR in June 2018. Uh, and so the scintigraphy rolled out uh, lymph node involvement or extra hepatic involvement. So she was transplanted in December 2018. The epithelioid hemangiotelioma um, is a uh, um, quite uh, rare liver tumor with an intermediate uh, aggressive behavior. And from the analysis of the European Liver Transplant Registry, um, authors uh, uh, evaluate that uh, uh, macrovascular invasion and detected pathology and the healer in lymph node invasions, as well as the um, the pre liver and transplant waiting time less than 120 days are independent risk factors for post liver transplant recurrence. But uh, um, from a radiological point of view, the macrovascular uh, invasion and the healer lymph node invasion can be detected. Um, and so we have a patient with multiple liver lesions suspected for um, epithelioid hemangiotelioma uh, at MR increasing during follow up without evidence of macrovascular invasion and with PET negative. Um, this patient was submitted to um, percutaneous biopsy, uh, not diagnostic, unfortunately, and so uh, she was submitted to surgical biopsy that confirms the diagnosis of epithelioid hemangiotelioma. Uh, and so after luring out uh, macrovascular invasion at CT, the patient was transplanted last April successfully. Uh, what about cholangiocarcinoma? The problem for uh, radiologists is uh, to diagnose the perihelar cholangiocarcinoma. Um, the diagnostic criteria is the presence of a dominant stricture of the perihelar by duct. Um, and so the imaging have to uh, evaluate the stricture itself, uh, as well as the presence of intrahepatic or extrahepatic lymph nodes. But sometimes we are not able to evaluate the presence of lymph nodes, and so a surgical exploration is needed. Like in this case, we can observe the presence of uh, uh, um, by the dilation of the left and right um, uh, by ducts uh, with the presence of uh, the lesion uh, peri uh, healer um, less than 3 cm. 
And so um, this man was submitted to surgical exploration, but the lesion was unresectable. Um, and uh, they found an occlusion of both left and right hepatic duct with the presence of neoplastic tissue contiguous to left and right portal branches with extension to main portal trunk. Uh, lymph node biopsies were negative, so patients were transplanted last November, and this is the MR uh, acquired during follow-up and the patient was okay. And um, uh, focusing uh, on the fact that uh, the uh, accurate staging of nodal status uh, is a key uh, step in uh, cholangiocarcinoma, uh, sometimes the preoperative determination of nodal status is difficult based on conventional imaging procedures. And uh, in these studies, uh, um, was uh, this study was conducted to evaluate uh, a radiomics model uh, for predicting lymph node metastasis of uh, intrahepatic collagen carcinoma in more than uh, 100 patients. And uh, the radiomics uh, nomograms resulted to be in the, an independent uh, preoperative predictor of overall and recurrence free survival. And what about um, hepatocellular carcinoma, last but not least, uh, because as we already um, listened, uh, the um, degree of tumor response uh, uh, to bridging treatment is a key point in this kind of patients. Uh, and as guidelines uh, indicate, the composite criteria um, has to be considered surrogates of tumor biology and response to neoadjuvant treatments in combination with tumor size and number of nodules are li likely to replace conventional criteria for defining transplantability. And we uh, also saw that pathological response um, to pre-transplant local regional therapy is uh, predictive of, pa uh, of patients' outcome after liver transplant for ACC, um, and, um, but sometimes for um, a radiological point of view, it's not so easy to understand the tumor response after uh, the kind of uh, treatment. For example, um, after radioembolization, that is a promising technique in those staging uh, patients because the radioembolization can lead to necrosis or to shrinkage of lesions or vanishing on the lesion itself. Um, uh, the MR with hepatobiliary contrast media can help us, but also with hepatobiliary contrast media, it's quite hard to differentiate from um, a fibrosis um, um, due to um, radioembolization and a new lesion in uh, uh, another lobe. Uh, and so uh, we can use other tools such as uh, diffusion weighted imaging because uh, ADC seems uh, to be significantly higher in necrotic areas than in viable tumor areas. Uh, and so we can tell that uh, um, the uh, modified resist criteria um, used uh, to evaluate dynamic MRI and uh, dynamic CT is useful to define tumor response after RFA and uh, microreablation and uh, um, uh, taste. Um, and the added value of hepatospecific contrast agents still to be defined, but the functional MR could provide valuable information to define tumor response and patient's prognosis. And uh, so I would uh, like to uh, I would like to show you this case of a patient uh, with uh, an infiltrating ACC in the right liver lobe, and we decided to treat um, this with a, a whole new insert, um, and uh, the uptake of lesion was optimal. And in fact, uh, after uh, forty five days, uh, um, the lesion were, was um, uh, smaller uh, and also um, the alpha fetoprotein goes down uh, and so the patient was transplanted 81 days after CERT um, and at pathology 50% uh, of necrosis and viable tumor um, at the periphery of tumor and uh, cellular atypia was found probably due to radiation injury uh, and uh, also inflammatory response uh, probably due to um, a fibroblastic reaction. Uh, and so the patient was transplanted within up to seven criteria. And uh, so um, at the end, I would like, uh, like to show you uh, this preliminary experience uh, in our center um, in, with a rat part correlation in the naive livers from patients undergoing the liver transplant. Um, and livers were examined by ultra high magnetic field, seven Tesla, 
uh, with the aim uh, to identify MR imaging characteristics and MR quantitative biomarkers, uh, which can provide information about lesion characterization and as well as ACC grading. And this is an example of the qualitative sequences scored with the corresponding histological microscopic slices. And also, uh, these are quantitative sequences, uh, and uh, uh, it was possible to um, to found uh, a, a correlation between the relation time um, and the lesion histology, particularly using a T1 relation time uh, with uh, ultra fast um, sequences uh, called the MRF. Um, so, in conclusion, uh, if uh, uh, for the um, Coloratran carcinoma, uh, the PET is of paramount importance for the hepatic disease and metabolic activity evaluation. For neuroendocrine and more, uh, give us information with diffusion weighting imaging and hepatobiliary imaging for lesion characterization in tripartite diffusion. Um, for cholangiocarcinoma and epithelioid and we have to evaluate the lymph node involvement. And particularly for, for epithelioid endothelioma, we have to exclude with the imaging macrovascular invasion. And for HCC, uh, in the bridging and outstaging setting, imaging will play a pivotal role to evaluate response to the neoadjuvant therapy. And in the future, we would like to assess also um, tumor grading. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, Elena. I don't. I don't know if uh, Vincenzo wants to make a comment on uh, your presentation. No, I think that uh, we can uh, proceed with the presentation. He is. Uh, she is did uh, a very comprehensive review uh, on on this. Uh, uh, the next speakers uh, is uh, David James Pinato. Uh, David is a clinical scientist and a consultant oncologist uh, working at the Department of Surgery and Cancer at the Imperial College in London. Uh, he is a, a fantastic uh, translational research expert uh, with a lot of interest in anti-cancer immunotherapy. Um, he has a lot of studies going on in this and uh, is becoming a world leader in this area. I'm also proud to introduce him because we, I share with him the same place of birth. Uh, we were <laughs> born both in Novara, which is a small town in the province uh, in the north part of Italy. So uh, thank you, David, for being here today. It is my pleasure. Thank you very much for the, for the kind introduction. Uh, so my job here is actually quite tough because I have to discuss the timing and modulation of systemic therapy in the transplant setting. These are my disclosures, and obviously you can, you're welcome to share the details of my presentation on Twitter. So a little bit of an overview of my talk. So we'll be discussing liver transplantation as this magic therapy uh, from the point of view of an ambulance oncologist. Uh, we will challenge, uh, discuss the challenges in the delivery of systemic anti-cancer therapy in patients who have received a transplant and why this could and should actually impact our research agenda in, in the clinic and going forward and how we can then make sense of it all. So how do we normally or we should integrate systemic anti-cancer therapy in this novel and expanding transplant era? So I thought it would be nice to start from history, from what really changed the landscape um, of liver transplantation in the oncological setting. This is very uh, easy for me because it looks at my disease area of interest, the patocellular carcinoma, and the curves on the left-hand side, the couple of my curves for overall survival for liver transplantation are far above and beyond whatever I could potentially offer to any of my patients with systemic therapy. So with a little bit of jealousy, I must say that liver transplantation is actually a highly effective and expanding therapeutic options for hepatocellular carcinoma, as well as for many other cancers beyond the HCC, as we have heard from the previous speakers. And I think part and parcel of the research that led from uh, the you know, establishment of Milan criteria, the milestone, has been to really try and try and expand the benefits of, you know, of liver transplant because we all recognize that 
liver transplant is highly effective. And therefore, you know, with varying uh, sort of nuances in terms of survival, uh, you know, those criteria can be maybe relaxed, can be selected. But the issue that I have as an oncologist when it comes to liver transplant is that, uh, you know, it's it's a highly effective therapy, but should we really be thinking about liver transplant as being just this triumph, or is there something that we should be sort of worried about? Is there anything else that we can do to sort of further optimize liver transplantation? Is there anything that the oncologist potentially can do to further help uh, transplant physicians and transplant surgeons? And I think as a testimonial of this, I thought I would use Andrea Mantegna. So this very painting was actually bought from uh, by King Charles I, uh, the only uh, British king that lost his head uh, was actually quite, you know, uh, interested in in, in Italian uh, in Italian um, art, and I think, you know, similarly, you know, uh, liver transplantation is certainly something that has been exported from Italy widely uh, throughout the world. However. The problem with liver transplant is that it does benefit only a minority of patients up front. The majority of patients that come to my clinic as an oncologist sadly cannot hope for this treatment ever. Uh, there is still an issue, small, but you know, potentially expanding the more we relax the criteria about post-transplant recurrence. Uh, there are a number of treatments that can try and expand the eligibility. We've discussed bridging as well as downstaging. But however, these therapies do not really act systemically. So they only act within the tumor uh, without providing systemic protection or treatment of the potential micrometastatic disease. There is no approved adjuvant therapy after transplant. And actually it is a challenge to deliver systemic therapy after transplant. And we'll try and discuss why. So in a nutshell, there is really no time to rest on the laurels. We should really you know, keep, keep our hands dirty on the topic and try and expand more from what we've done so far. So if I think about the barriers of delivering systemic anti-cancer therapy in solid organ transplant recipients in general and in liver transplant recipients in particular is the first of all, the lack of level one evidence of benefit of combining systemic therapy with uh, liver transplant. So in patients that, for example, require chemotherapy for any cancers and have a solid organ transplant on board, there is very little to suggest that they would benefit because in any sort of tumor type, you know, the studies excluded uh, transplant recipients. This is particularly true uh, because a lot of, um, in particular important, because a lot of the therapies that we use oncologically induce immunosuppression. And this is a clear concern in patients who already are on uh, immunosuppressants. Chemotherapy can exert synergistic myelotoxicity with, um, in the context of transplant. Um, novel agents such as immunotherapy uh, can actually promote rejection and graft loss. In particular, immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, have not been tested in the context of solid organ, organ transplant in clinical trials. And if we think about tyrosine kinase inhibitors as well as chemotherapy, there is always the risk of drug-drug interactions. In particular, a lot of chemotherapy, such as the taxane platinum-based agents, uh, they, are, they all converge with, uh, throughout the cytochrome oxidation pathways. And therefore, this is often a challenge in patients who have a, a transplant on board. We have discussed about immunotherapy, certainly a treatment that is up and coming. And unfortunately, you know, the level of evidence for immunotherapy in transplanted patients is of fairly low quality, mostly observational studies. Uh, I think the, 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 the biggest CK series are, are listed here. Key point from these studies is that there is a very high rate of graft rejection risk, up to 40%, mortality of 50%. So these are patients that were treating palliatively who basically have solid tumors of any sort, lung, um, bowel, etc., and they get treated with immunotherapy, uh, risking potentially uh, to die from it. And, you know, this is a median overall survival from one of the series. And actually, if in patients that experience analog graft rejection, the median overall survival is clearly reduced. There is a high risk of mortality due to the risk of rejection. Perhaps an elegant study that is not solely focusing on HCC, but on cancers in general, uh, is this one. It is a French experience that tells us how difficult it is to organize an optimal oncological plan. So here we're really considering everything that could potentially benefit the patient and we are looking at the difference between transplanted and non-transplanted patients. So, um, you know, if you're able to perform an oncological plan for the patients that is in keeping with what we know in non-transplanted patients, 
the survival of the patients will be optimal. However, look at the side on the left hand side, only 85% um, of the patients with localized cancer that happens in patients with transplant uh, with, with the transplant on board happen to receive an optimal management. Others need to have some form of, of adaptation. And in advanced disease, this drops to 57%. And actually, when we when it came to look at how many patients actually had that plan, that adapted plan performed. Uh, you know, we're going even lower, 80% in local disease and 38%. So what is the cause for this, the, this advantage? Why are transplant recipients not able to receive optimal oncological care? And you can see in the arrows why that is. So both for localized and advanced disease, uh, there are a number of risks, uh, concerns from the physicians in terms of the transplanted organ, comorbidities, contraindications to immunotherapy, as well as toxicity from treatment. And actually, as a result of it, uh, on the right hand side, you've got the multivariate analysis that looked at the fact that if you're receiving optimal oncological therapy, you survive better. But actually, if you have a transplant and if you can't do that, you're going to survive much, much less. And I think this brings me to the idea, why can we not use uh, systemic anti-cancer therapy perhaps earlier if we can uh, in those patients that might be eligible for liver transplants. And I think this is surely what is happening across a number of oncological indication. I think in this particular case, the Kaplan-Meier curves that I projected here uh, are derived from Imbrave 150, the study of atezolizumab and bevacizumab that has surely revolutionized the treatment of advanced patients with HCC. Um, with an, a median overall survival of 20 months. So certainly when we are seeing these great advantages in advanced disease, the first thing that we think, can we translate to early stage disease? But the challenge here is that the treatment goals are entirely new. We're not really just thinking about prolonging overall survival. We've heard this very eloquently from Professor Chilo, but actually we're thinking about different goals. Can we cure the disease? Can we increase the chances of cure or perhaps even just prolong the disease-free interval, um, which is much different compared to simply improving the overall survival, even though that's not a simple task to, to be achieved anyway. Uh, and I think this is where timing is very important, especially in transplant. There are many different ways we can use uh, systemic therapy in this particular context. We can think about adjuvant therapy post-operatively, we can think about new adjuvant, uh, we can think about systemic therapy potentially as bridging or downstaging now that we have therapies that, for example, are able of inducing radiologically appreciable uh, response. But actually the goals are very different from any of these scenarios. What are we trying to achieve? Are we trying to treat micrometastatic disease? Are we keen to test the biology? Are we keen to prevent relapse or increase the chances of complete response? So all these are questions that require the right drugs at the right time for the right patient. And I think one of the things that we're seeing is that there is a, a wide widening um, combination of treatments. So TKIs uh, per se are not particularly useful, neither in the adjuvant or the new adjuvant setting. They hardly ever produce a response rate in patients, and they're very difficult to think about downstaging uh, molecules. Uh, however, we now have immunotherapy combinations as well as sometimes monotherapies. And on the right hand side, you really have what I think is, is the potential advantage from combining systemic therapies is the idea of trying to push that curve a little bit higher and even higher by combining more therapeutic modalities so that more patients can be recurrence, disease-free and survive long time, so achieve real long-term survivorship. Uh, if I think about hepatobiliary disease, the evidence out there is very, very scanty. Even for disease areas like you know, col uh, cholangiocarcinoma, for example, the BILCAP study, yes, has shown some form of improvement in resected cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, again, no data around transplant. STORM was a study that looked at serafinib post RFA or resection for HCC. Again, no clear indication in, uh, in, uh, uh, in HCC post transplant. Immunotherapy, we will discuss. Uh, and then there is also the issue of potential new adjuvant therapy, which I will talk about briefly. Um, these are uh, uh, immunostochemical pictures that look at PDL1 expression in hepatocellular carcinoma on the left hand side. Uh, people that uh, have a higher degree of PDL1 expression are more likely to experience worse outcome. And on the right hand side, if we combine a number of RNA uh, um, sequencing features, we can actually say that those patients that have a more immune exhausted microenvironment are also the ones that are going to do badly. So 
there is really biologically a sense of potentially combining immunotherapy as an adjuvant therapy in patients potentially post-transplant. And I think there is evidence to suggest that uh, CIK, so combined um, uh, um, cell agents that were sort of incubated with uh, interleukin and then were infused with the patient, so adoptive cellular therapy, is actually the only immunotherapy that was ever proven to be of survival benefit, again, in resected patients with very limited toxicity. Um, and we now have a number of clinical trials. This is again, looking specifically in HCC, looking at PD-1 monotherapies, as well as in combination with bevacizumab antivascular agents uh, as treatments proposed in the adjuvant setting. However, there is, and there will be a significant lag behind when it comes to liver transplant, because all these trials, which are due to report between next year and 2025, and are all looking at the resection landscape, will not include any patients with a liver transplant. Uh, and I think the reason is here. We have, again, very good evidence to suggest from meta-analysis that allograft rejection can happen, can be as high as 40%. And actually, not only that, but patients who are transplanted tend to unfortunately respond much less to immunotherapy. The rates of progression, perhaps as a result of under, underlying immune suppression, uh, is actually much lower. And the median of overall survival in general is actually quite low, only 36 weeks. So adjuvant immunotherapy, I personally think, is going to be heavily discouraged post-liver transplanting going forward. So how can we try and improve the benefit from systemic therapy in the transplant setting. Well, you know, there are many advantages from adjuvant immunotherapy, um, such as the fact that we can certainly select patients on clear histopathological criteria, and also we don't delay their primary therapy. Uh, however, if we think about adjuvant therapy, we can't really measure the response objectively on CT scans. We actually defer the treatment of micrometastasis, and we don't really test the biology on the patient. So we don't really know how these treatments work. So I think that especially in transplant, new adjuvant therapy might have a potential role with systemic treatment. First of all, because we might potentially improve surgical outcomes by shrinking the disease, we can treat the micrometastasis and therefore act on long-term survivorship and relapse a little bit better. We can provide the transplant surgeons with an in vivo sensitivity test. We can tell the, the surgeons, this patient is actually good biology. And also it's interesting for research because we can look at biomarkers pre and post treatment with pre biopsies and resection or transplant material. The problem that I have is histological confirmation, and maybe we could discuss this in the, you know, in, 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 as a question, you know, how likely are we to accept a biopsy, uh, you know, in patients who have, uh, for example, HCC or other, or other liver-related malignancies? How comfortable are we to defer primary therapy in patients who are potentially transplantable? Uh, and how are we going to manage the risk of dropout to toxicity or progression if treatment doesn't work? And I think, you know, these um, data here are from mice, uh, but I thought I would like to show you because they basically suggest that actually immunotherapy, that actually surgery is the best immunotherapy ever. In the, in the graph on the left hand side, you can see that uh, mice that basically had late surgery, day 16 after having been given immunotherapy, were actually characterized by higher mortality rate. Whereas if you give immunotherapy to the mice and if you treat them with surgery at day 10, not one day later, they actually have this, you know, with the same procedures, same uh, immunotherapy regimen, they can actually survive a long period of time. And on the right hand side, in this particular study, they looked at the immune function and look at the high peak of those patients that of those mice that basically receive immunotherapy plus surgery. So there is definitely some form of truth in suggesting that surgery per se has got an immunogenic effect on these patients. So if we could translate this concept in patients, it would be fantastic to see synergy between liver transplant and surgery. But obviously the problem is that even if we think about the new adjuvant studies, and here we've got a few, including a study that I've had the pleasure of leading here at Imperial called Prime HCC, um, we have a number of different type of schedules. So epinevo versus pembrolizumab versus nivolumab. Um, all of these treatments are only looking at transplant. And again, uh, the studies will be reporting in the next few years, but liver transplant has been excluded. So there is a need to sort of perhaps champion this particular segment of the population to further improve outcomes 
from the disease. So I guess we do have a lot of open questions and new challenges from integration. First of all, how safe will the integration be? Are we going to check, are we going to choose double checkpoint inhibitors? The problem with this is that they tend to be fairly hepatotoxic and I'm not sure how willing our surgical colleagues will be in terms of operating on a patient who has got active hepatitis. Second question, we have a lot of VEGF targeting combinations. These come with bleeding, wound dealing, and I am not a surgeon, but I'm scared of the post-surgical complications in people that have been exposed to VEGF. So I think we should really have the MDT and the research community thinking about these issues um, more broadly. Secondly, what is the best utility for neoadjuvant immunotherapy? Are we thinking about downstaging, bridging? Are we thinking about this as simple relapse reducing strategy? All these uh, utilities have got very different endpoints that need to be considered. Thirdly, patient heterogeneity. How are we going to select for uh, the oncologic disease burden? Milan criteria, more expanded, less expanding. The problem is also that of organ availability and listing priorities. These are change as a result of geographical origin. Third problem, liver dysfunction, which is also another issue. Uh, so we would probably only be able to treat patients with Charles A and transplantable patients. So again, another element of heterogeneity. And fourthly, and lastly, uh, what is the uh, current role, what is the potential role of neoadjuvant systemic immunotherapy going to look like with regards to current or future liver transplant practice? Are we going to expand criteria even more? Uh, are we going to look at major pathological response? These uh, rates of response have been seen as predictive of outcome in neoadjuvant studies, for example, in lung and melanoma. So uh, it, it could potentially be that even in liver-related transplant uh, oncology, these measures might be very useful. So uh, to conclude, I am very excited to say that liver transplant continues to remain, thanks to the ongoing effort of the community, the most effective oncological therapy for any of the patients that I will ever see in my clinic. However, this remains a treatment option that is limited and the efficacy of it stems from selection. And I think integration with systemic anti-cancer therapy can potentially broaden the scope of liver transplant. And I think more than ever, it is important that we discuss as a multidisciplinary team, not only how to manage patients day in, day out, but also to think about the research agenda for tomorrow so that we continue to improve and give patients what they deserve, which is really long-term survivorship. And with that, I thank you very much for the invite. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, really, for the presentation, David. Uh, it was very clear. Uh, uh, the, the, the topic is absolutely fascinating huge amount of uh, issue to be clarified and to be tested. I'm scared about uh, the fact that uh, Big Pharma is away from the transplantation field. They are supposed to be a little bit more courageous because it's a fantastic clinical uh, and clinical scientific setting in order to test a product and a new, a new potential, also from the pathophysiologic point of view. Uh, we need to go uh, to the last speaker because we are short on time. And uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Tom Ivanik. I think that the, the pronunciation is Ivanik's. Uh, he's from Sweden, uh, but he's been uh, fully trained uh, at Mayo Clinic first and then at the University of Toronto. And now he's working uh, in the group of uh, Gonzalo Sapizukin. And, and, and the, the issue that we wanted to, to put on stage today is absolutely visionary in a way. Uh, is, is the, the, the adoption of artificial intelligence and machine learning in the context of transplant oncology. I think is the way to go, but let's see. Uh, Tommy, please, if you're ready. And sure, clearly thank you so much. Yeah, sure. In the meantime, still waiting for, for the question from the audience to be written in the question and answer uh, box, please. So again, thank you, uh, Professor Chinglo and Matsapero and the ESOT for the opportunity to be here and, and give this talk. Uh, I'm going to be scratching the surface a little bit about the artificial intelligence and machine learning and transplant oncology and what has been done and kind of uh, future moving forward. Uh, I have no disclosures. You're welcome to share uh, details of this information or this talk on social media. So transplant oncology, uh, essentially transplant for hepatobiliary malignancies, hepatocellular carcinoma, phalangeal carcinoma, colorectal liver metastases, is a very good treatment option. Uh, and we've seen that um, it may not be the ideal treatment for everyone. Um, you know, 
because we have to be very careful with who we select for these for this treatment and also uh, given that there's not enough organs to go around. We have to be very carefully uh, selecting patients based on pathologic imaging and clinical characteristics as we've seen in HCC, for example. So criteria can be uh, pathological, uh, clinical, or imaging-based, as mentioned. So in recent years, we've seen a vast amount of variables that have been collected. Uh, there's uh, complex connections between these, and while some of these may have a linear uh, relationship with uh, transplant outcomes, for example, AFP, the higher the AFP, the, the higher the chance that you will die in a shorter amount of time after a treatment, uh, some ha have a very complicated uh, pattern between them. And it makes it very challenging for physicians to make treatment decisions in a, in a timely and effective way. So this is really where artificial intelligence can offer an opportunity to bridge this gap between information overload and actually making critical decisions. So what, what exactly is artificial intelligence? As uh, Liu and others have defined it in their JAMA article, describing automated systems that can perform uh, tasks considered to require intelligence. So this is an excellent paper for anyone that's interested in reading and understanding machine learning uh, papers that are applied to any field of medicine, just to understand the, the definitions and the concepts. So there are subcategories within this uh, of artificial intelligence, and these include things like language processing, robotics, uh, machine learning, as well as deep learning. And within this presentation, I'm going to primarily be discussing the machine learning aspect because I think this is the most relevant to transplant oncology. So what is machine learning? So machine learning is basically taking historical data outcomes. You've seen massive amounts of data being generated in re recent years and inputting that into a model. And that model then generates an output. And this output is typically some form of uh, prediction, uh, you know, when the patient is going to recur, when the patient is going to die or survive after treatment. And then using that information, you can apply that to individual patients. And based on that, you can make a treatment decision. What is important, well, this is just like a, a general um, you know, prediction model, but I'll show how this is a little bit different from this, the standard logistic regression-based models. But it is important to note that this is not a static model. So the more information that we gather on, on these patients, uh, then can be fed back into uh, the model to make it better, to improve prediction, and to, to yield better uh, treatment decisions ultimately. So there are two uh, concepts uh, within machine learning. Uh, one is supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So what, what that means is really for supervised learning, you take data that is labeled along with outcomes, and you generate an association, a prediction for this outcome. And essentially what this outcome is, that is that it is typically a gold standard. Somebody has said, this is a recurrence, this is a death. So this is the label that you've given to the outcome. In contrast, the unsupervised learning, which is really hasn't been done, applied too much uh, in medicine, is taking unlabeled data inputting it into model and allowing the model to identify patterns or clusters uh, within that data. You require a lot more data to be able to, to, uh, to have some use with this type of uh, model uh, approach. So uh, just to uh, put this into perspective, logistic regression, which is the basis for many prediction models that we have, typically is a single layer You input variables and you see how they're associated with an with, uh, with an outcome. Uh, these typically, but not always, result in a lower area under the curve, so being less predictive of outcomes, basically classifying a patient of having the outcome or not. Now, in contrast, the modern machine learning uses a lot of these similar logistic regression-based models, I mean, some, not, but not all, and offers a layered multidimensional approach. So the contrast is that you analyze a lot more variables, the models typically would yield higher area under the curve, being more predictive of uh, outcomes, and also has the opportunity of adapting to the data that's added to the model. So how does this, uh, uh, what has been done really in the field, transplant oncology, machine learning has the, uh, the, the progress that's been done in this field is really within three separate realms. So one is within clinical pathologic variables, genomics, and then imaging. 
sorted in separate silos. So how does this uh, kind of translate into clinical practice? I, I figured this would be a good way to represent that what aspects of, of clinical care uh, we can apply these, these methods. So in, the, uh, uh, in this question, so just to answer that, which patients are at most risk for HCC? Uh, Patients can be stratified at, at low risk and high risk for HCC uh, based on clinical pathologic and genomic signatures. And this is a study from 2004, so a little bit older, but uh, Kim and others published in Hepatology. They evaluated 59 tissue samples from liver explants after liver transplantation. They generated a cDNA microarray with over 9,000 genes per sample. They used K nearest neighbor and support vector machine methods, so machine based algorithms. And they were able to identify a molecular signature constituting of 30 genes that were altered in cirrhotic patients at risk for, for HCC. And if we use uh, you know, these kind of gene signature, they can potentially be used as uh, biomarkers for early detection in HCC, and uh, especially in patients that are at high risk and potentially pave the way for chemo prevention strategies. And then moving on, uh, on the basis of risk, uh, individualized screening protocols can be implemented and also offer a rationale for identifying uh, chemo prevention strategies potentially for patients that are at high risk. Um, and in this study from 2020, this was published in European Journal of Radiology. This group used radiomics, which is essentially um, converting uh, uh, CT scans or MRI scans of, of tumors and or livers containing the tumors into data that we can actually analyze. So you tell the machine uh, algorithm to make uh, some kind of prediction based on what uh, what kind of uh, radiomic features the tumor has and, and uh, associate that with an outcome. So that they, they tested various uh, different machine learning uh, models. So the KNN, which is the nearest neighbor, the support vector, uh, 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 model and the uh, and then the random forest, and you see that the KNN had the highest AUC. But it is important to note that uh, for uh, sometimes the KNN can be better, and sometimes the SVM can be better. So you have to really kind of test all of these uh, for whatever you're doing. And then uh, moving on, uh, combining risk stratification and individualized screening can lead to potentially earlier diagnosis, and this is a a very interesting study published in Annals of Surgical Oncology last year by Liao and others. They created a automated pipeline to evaluate quantitative features from histopathological slides of HCC patients. So they obtained the slides from the Cancer Genome Atlas and then tissue microarray images from the West China Hospital. The features were then used to train a model using machine learning methods to predict patient survival. They extracted a 1,733 uh, imaging features constructed a diagnostic classifier and based on 31 elements. Then they allowed the model uh, to distinguish HCC from adjacent normal tissue in the training and external validation set. In the training set, they had an AUC of 0.988, and in the uh, external validation, 0.886, as seen here on this slide. So what this basically means is that you can potentially replace uh, a pathologist, because you can look at these images, you can look at these slides and be able to correctly stratify uh, patients. And then once a diagnosis has been made, therapy can then be personalized based on predicted tumor phenotypes, response to treatment, and then long-term oncologic outcomes. So of course, early examples of the risk scores for transplant, uh, we know the moral score, metro ticket, AFP, Milan, and others, uh, that really aim to individualize transplant treatment decisions using models that include mainly clinical pathologic data. So in this study, we wanted to see if we can use radiomics, this was published just now in transplantation. We wanted to see if we could use radiomics to predict adverse oncologic events after patients had been enrolled on the transplant waitlist for HCC. So these are all patients, a group of patients that um, were waitlisted for HCC, they received uh, TACE as a bridge, and we used radiomics to see if we could predict adverse outcomes. So those adverse outcomes included HCC progression on the waitlist, and then HCC recurrence after transplant. So these are uh, major oncologic adverse events. And then we found that just by using radiomics alone, um, we could 
uh, identify uh, or be able to classify this with a fairly high AUC of 0 0.87. So um, this, keep in mind that this is only radiomics. This was a proof of concept model and didn't really include any additional clinical uh, or clinical characteristics or genomic characteristics. Another uh, study by Yi and others in 2003, they evaluated ECC samples. They used a supervised machine learning algorithm and they found a gene expression profile that was present in metastatic deposits as well as in the primary tumor. And they identified them at 153 gene model that could predict 85% of newly metastatic ECC patients. So if you see that this particular mar marker osteopontin was present in the primary tumor, that would predict eventually metastasis. And then after treatment, putting together the available clinical pathologic uh, uh, imaging and genomic variables, we can potentially do better at detecting relapse earlier. And this is just a study from Gu and others uh, two years ago published in Journal of Radiology that put together radiomics together with clinical uh, characteristics to be able to uh, correctly um, or with an AUC of 0 0.785 and in the training and then 0 0.789 in the validation set could um, essentially uh, improve who and how we're going to do post-transplant screening. So as you see, uh, the, the main uh, research within this field has taken place sort of in a siloed approach. People have used machine learning in clinic, using it on clinical pathologic variables, on genomics, as well as imaging, but hopefully the future will, will allow some kind of amalgamation, putting all these together and to build even better prediction models. And then just to wrap up uh, in terms of uh, good things about machine learning, uh, we have big data, we have great mathematical models to be able to make sense of these. Uh, it can potentially be helpful in clinical decision support uh, by improving precision and accuracy, uh, offering uh, models that take into account nonlinear relationships, reducing potential bias, and recognizing patterns that we would not have otherwise recognized. However, it is important to note that whatever you put into the model is whatever you get out. So if low quality data goes in, you're going to get low quality data out. Overfitting is, um, is a big potential with, with these models, and you're going to get potentially an AUC of 0 0.98 if you don't also look at external data sets. Uh, and it's really important to do validation to make sure that you're not uh, to allow that these data is generalized or reproducible. And then obviously subjective data is suboptimal in, in this regard because a radiologist in Toronto may, may grade uh, a tumor response differently than somebody, let's say in Stockholm. Uh, so we need to have a uh, measure that are objective that can be transferred between institutions in order to get the most out of these models. And then we need to be cautious in implementing these models and really test them potentially with even randomized trials. So future directions, uh, integrating data across the different disciplines, like across these different silos, which requires prospective databases, multi-institutional uh, cooperations. And then lastly, we have to be very mindful of that this is not just about oncology, but also uh, taking into account organ allocation, which differs on an international level between urgency, utility, and benefit-based allocation systems. The organ allocation strategy is in the U.S. may be different from that in Canada. So a model that works very well in Canada may not necessarily work uh, good uh, in the U.S. So we have to be very mindful with that when we implement it. So. Uh, some acknowledgments, the Toronto Liver Cancer Research Group, Dr. Gonzalo Sapisochin, my mentor, and uh, Annie Gravely, uh, one of our research students who helped to design these slides. So and thanks again for the opportunity to present. Thanks a lot, Tommy. Uh, I don't know if uh, Vincenzo has any comment on your presentation. I think we are short on time and we have uh, room just for a uh, few burning issues and, and questions. Vincenzo. Uh, this, this was very fascinating. I'm just uh, uh, wonder what kind of uh, infrastructure we should change in our hospitals, in our groups to, to go in this direction. And, uh, and, and as, as, uh, if I understand well, uh, is this the, probably the future for selecting the best therapy 
uh, among many alternatives for our patient. What's your uh, view on this? Thank you so much for that question. So I think for, for the first point, how, how are we gonna you know, implement or how are we gonna change the infrastructure? I think it's really important because we have all this data. We have electronic medical records. We're collecting all this data on patients, but we have to be able to sort of integrate the electronic medical records so that we can prospectively collect patients. Otherwise it's some student that is interpreting the data and putting it into a data set, maybe an Excel sheet, which is obviously suboptimal. So one is to be able to have clear definitions of what all of these variables mean and prospectively collect them, collect as much data as we can, integrate the electronic medical records so that we can uh, get the data immediately so that we can, if we apply a model that we can continually, you know, take out the human being from the equation and refine these models because the data is collected, you know, as the day goes on in clinical practice. And I think, um, with regards to, to other aspects, uh, you know, radiology, these are all commercial uh, programs, the radiomics technology that can be applied. Again, uh, the model that we presented with the radiomics is really still has some subjectivity. It's, there's still a radiologist that has to outline where is the tumor in the liver, which there is some potential bias because one radiologist may outline it differently from another radiologist. So again, we have to take out the radio, we have the software, but then how can we take out the, the, the personal aspect, the subjectivity from it? We can use something called um, basically a convolutional neural network. So take into the account the whole liver. So you just have to tell the, the algorithm, where is the liver? And then you can find, because a lot of patients have different you know, tumors, the dysplastic nodules and things that also may drive potentially the prognosis. So take into the, the account the whole liver and create a unique um, kind of phenotype, tumor phenotype for the patient. So, uh, and the, the second question was, uh, can you remind me? The best therapy, the selection of the best therapy in, uh, for our patients since response to this therapy is crucial. Yeah, I, I think so. I think it still remains to be, you know, fully applied and see how much better we can do with these, mm -hmm. with these models. But I think, I mean, theoretically that if we apply and we, combine things that we can predict from imaging, things we can predict from just knowing the patient, the clinical pathologic variables, and then also genomics add on to that, I think potentially we can use that to drive treatment uh, algorithms and, and, and treatment decisions. Tell me, but uh, at the end of the day, there is still a huge amount of skepticism on, on the black box related to artificial intelligence and machine learning. So I, I think you, you pointed out very nicely that what we need to do is really to set randomized trial in order to, to be definitive on a clinical basis on the value of this uh, perspective. How many patients did you include in your transplantation study, which was a very interesting one? Yeah, so this was a very small uh, group of patients. We, we had 88 patients that we included. We narrowed it down to a very small subset of patients because the problem is that we wanted to have a very clean cohort. We wanted to have a patient cohort that had received just one type of therapy because if you get RFA and then a taste, then that signature may be very different. So uh, we selected a, a very clean, you know, taste only cohort. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. And David, uh, just a comment. Uh, if you were wondering on which is the, the best area of, of you know, of interest, uh, speaking about the, 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 the oncologic uh, support for the transplantation field, I think that the downstaging area is the most relevant one. Uh, so what we really need from the clinical point of view, from the, you know, the surgical point of view, we really need to, you know, come back, make some patient to come back in the, in the classical criteria and to have a, a nice response. And I think that there is a huge amount of, of room in order to operate on that from the oncological, uh, in the clearly neo-advanced setting. But uh, I, I'm also um, convinced that many patients, even after transplantation, may, may be treated with systemic therapy. We, 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 see, we, we see a number of occurrences and we see relatively stable uh, courses. And, and I wanted to, to, to know your comment on that. Thank you for the question. I like to approach this question by thinking about what happened in other tumors where we had highly effective systemic therapy. So I'm thinking about colorectal cancer. So when we started oncologically with 5-FU, 
monotherapy with a response rate that was in the region of five to ten percent radiologically and nobody could potentially even think about let's let alone transplant but even you know rfa or resect colorectal liver metastasis which is now part and parcel of the oncological management plan of anyone with metastatic colorectal cancer and liver deposit we always immediately ask the question is this person ever going to be managed with systemic therapy only or are we going to be able to offer them surgery and this is you know common knowledge uh, the truth will happen also in hcc but i think in a slightly more staged approach unless we as a community are a little bit brave so you you mentioned the resistance from uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, which I think are motivated by the fact that obviously safety is a big issue. Uh, second, the, you know, the revenues, uh, obviously, you know, providing uh, downstaging therapy is not really going to provide a lot of revenues. It's, it's more something that we have to do for patients' advocacy because we believe in it. And I have to say that even when I proposed the very first Neoadivan trial, to my own surgeons, we had to have endless discussions because people felt very scared about committing patients that are on a radical pathway of care towards systemic therapy, which in our mind is basically whatever we give to patients where, when they're at the end of the line. So I think everything starts from this paradigm shift. Everything starts from when we start thinking outside the box. And I think, you know, this is a part of our mandate as, as academic clinicians is really to try and not think about just what we have now, but what, how we could use these instruments best. Uh, and I think I agree with you that downstaging approach is the most appealing uh, because we have radiologic response rates. But David, sorry, uh, just a straight question. You have a patient with a, I would say near complete response after taste and followed by some kind of immunotherapy because of the you know exposure of tumor antigen you have a very nice response and this patient is uh, actually downstage i mean even if you are not thinking about transplant uh, this is now possibly a transplant candidate uh, with your experience would you send this patient to the transplant uh, board or not yeah that is provocative that is provocative <laughs> I will say yes, and I'm probably someone who is very brave amongst my category, because I'll tell you what the oncologist will feel like. The oncologist will feel that if a patient, let's say, has started as advanced, and if they're committed to a, a line of therapy that is giving them survival benefit, the idea of being very invasive and ask the surgeons to chip in is against our mentality. Because yeah. if, uh, what, what if you lose... What if you lose the control of the disease that you've you know, ever so brilliantly achieved with systemic therapy? Yeah. Now, my view is that if there is a response, there must be long-term benefit because in every single therapy, uh, Professor Mazzaferri, in every single one, if you're seeing an objective response, if the tumor goes down, this is like the dumb, you know, uh, look at the scan sort of thing, it's good news, all right? And if we are able, and if you, my job would be to convince you to say, are you going to operate on them? And that's when we're going to have the fight. That's when we're going to have the, you know, the conversation. But I don't feel that it's the time anymore to put predefined barriers to the treatment of patients, provided they're consented, provided they know okay. what the risks and the benefits are. So a pilot study on patient with responding to immuno and other therapy, local regional therapy, is, I would say, feasible for the oncology, medical oncology community. Maybe not all of us. Oh, you, I know, I know, but it's possible. Thank I you. I think, I think it is possible. I think we have to, we have to rely on what we are seeing in advanced disease. And I think it will come, I'm sure. But anyway, David, there is a huge amount of loss of chances for the patient in the moment. And the greater is the opportunity and the portfolio that you have in your hands and the oncological, uh, you know, uh, environment, uh, the greater, I think, is the, 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 the risk of losing chances. Because, yeah. again, as you said, some oncologists are trying and, and feeling that it's better to maintain instead of pushing ahead with a more radical kind of approach. And this is exactly what I consider a mistake and a loss of chance. But you need to diffuse your position as much as you can.
Yeah, let me be provocative just with one final comment. I dislike the idea that potentially the evidence that we will see will come from observational studies. So we will have centers somewhere in the world that will do this in a very dirty way yeah. and will probably risk us having uh, you know, published case reports somewhere, God knows where, where there is that patient that went absolutely wrong and this will shut down the attempts at expanding the use of systemic therapy in early stage disease. This is a real risk. It is done pretty much everywhere in the world. And I think this is why I advocate the use of pilot studies. You need to have a protocol. You need to be able to consent the patients. You need to be able to control yourself. You know when you start and when you stop because you have decided the rules beforehand and you know when it is, you know, uh, just okay to say, you know, we have lost the battle. And I think, for example, you know, for early phase studies in, in early stage disease, surgical dropouts, they should be monitored externally. You know, transplant dropouts, you know, if you're causing a patient a massive hepatitis or a bleed after surgery, these patients cannot go under the, you know, uh, undercover. They need to be reported. But at the same time, if you're achieving good results in a prospective, well-controlled, well-designed study, this is, you know, going to provide, you know, the step forward that we really need. Well, we will take a risk. I hope that some of you will do the same. Uh, Thank you. Th yeah. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Vincenzo, please just a final comment because we really have to conclude now because we are running out of time. No, no, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's to you. Please, please go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, thank you very much to all the speakers. Sorry for this rush, but we have, you know, <laughs> very tight uh, times and availability presentation were absolutely very informative we have some questions we will you know send to the speakers directly and this will be again uh, on transplant live at the end of the conference and just one advertorial as as far as uh, isot uh, congress in milan is going to be uh, end of august and first days of september that is going to be in person an in-person meeting so my invitation and Vincenzo's invitation, which is chair of the local committee, uh, is to uh, try any possibility to be present. It's going to be hybrid, clearly. There will be the possibility to have a virtual, but... Uh, okay. I think we are running out of time. Uh, but it's okay. Uh, thanks again to everybody. And, and I see you all for the next uh, ISOT webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao, Vincenzo. Thank you. Thank, Bye. you. Thank you all. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you, David. Thank you, Elena. Thank hey. you. Yeah. Bye. 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 Thanks. Thanks a lot. Good. We're, we're looking at, uh, at the, the final results of the webinar feedbacks, which is supposed to be launched, but, you know, we are running out of time. That's the reason why we are rushing. Uh, I was not sure that uh, the connection was still in place because it was done until, you know, 9.20 and we are uh, 7.20. We're now 7.23, but it, it's okay. So we are happy. Thank you for being here and uh, see you next time. Goodbye. Ciao. Ciao, 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 Vincenzo. Ciao.